Welcome to Foresight Friday Roundup, Foresight Health's podcast series for healthcare revolutionaries. Outcomes matter, customers count, and value rules. Hello again, everyone. This is Dave Verda, news editor at Foresight Health. It is Friday, January 21st. Did you order your free home COVID test yet? We did. And you know, they're not really free, right? Your taxes are paying for them because 25% of your family, friends, and neighbors won't get vaccinated. So not only are they killing us, but they're also costing us money. And speaking of costing us money, on today's episode of The Roundup, we're going to be talking about the Medicare Advantage program. Is it the model government privatization program that's providing new and expanded health benefits to millions of seniors? Is it an ATM machine for insurance companies that game the Medicare Advantage payment scheme to fill their pockets at the expense of millions of seniors? Or is it both? To sort it all out today are Dave Johnson, founder and CEO of Foresight Health, and Julie Merchantson, partner at Transformation Capital. Hi, Dave. Hi, Julie. How are you guys doing this morning? Dave? I'm feeling like it's deja vu all over again. Third winter in lockdown. Time is getting blurry. On the plus side, I've had a lot more time for writing. But as we used to say in Liberia when I was in the Peace Corps, what for do? Got it. Julie, how about you? How are you doing today? Well, I have a surprise for everybody. It's super exciting, but I have COVID. Yay! Oh, <laughs> seriously? Very exciting. Oh, no. I have a 13-year-old who plays club volleyball, and it's been ripping through her team. And, you know, a mom and a daughter can spend a lot of time together. So here we go. Oh, it's not so bad. Wow. And, and you're vaxxed and boosted. Vaxxed and boosted. And how are you feeling? You know, I feel like I barely, barely have a cold. I have a, mm-hmm. an underlying headache that's annoying, but like not terrible. And I'm just mm-hmm. super annoyed because I'm a little bit anxious. Like I've now I finally have yeah. it and it's better than any cold I've ever had, but I can't stop thinking about the fact that I have it. So that's the hard part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dave, that leaves me and you. <laughs> the last two standing. Yeah. 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 Julie, I thought you were going to be the last one standing, but. Uh, me too. Yeah, I was gonna... really gunning for it. I'm staying in lockdown, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch Omega Man with Charlton Heston tonight just to <laughs> get me psyched up. Well, speedy recovery to you and your daughter and, and anybody else in your family who may come down with it. So. Oh, I thanks. I just wanted to share with everybody. It's really not that bad, depending upon, you know, what you show up with. Yeah. No. Okay. Hang in there. After that, I don't know uh, what the rest of the show will be like, but well, yeah, that was it. Yeah. We peaked early. All right. All right. Let's, let's try to talk about Medicare Advantage and we'll start by asking you about your secondhand knowledge of the program. Dave, do you know anyone in a MA plan? And if so, what's their opinion of it? I know several people who are enrolled in MA plans and their reports are almost universally good. They like the lower non-existent premiums, plus all the incremental benefits, dental, vision, subsidized drug, therapeutic massages, even free gym memberships. They're happy. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Julie, how about you? Any friends or family in an MA plan and what has been their experience? I think I've talked about this before. I wish my mom were in an MA plan, but I'm starting to have friends who are transitioning into MA plans and I'm watching how that's happening. And we're just getting a lot smarter at getting people into MA. So that's been interesting. Yeah, process is a little easier. And I'm sure I mentioned this before, but my mom's in an MA plan and she loves it. Uh, she really loves the $0 copay for some of her prescription meds. And, and, you know, seniors on a fixed income, it's all about the Benjamins. So she's very happy. Okay, let's talk about the good of Medicare Advantage. This past fall, Milliman released two reports on behalf of the Better Medicare Alliance. That's the trade group representing MA plans. The first report said MA plans deliver more than $32 billion each year in additional benefits and lower out-of-pocket costs to enrollees compared with traditional Medicare. The second report said the number of MA plans offering supplemental benefits, like in-home support services to enrollees, rose 43% this year compared with last year. Dave, what's your reaction to these two reports and what's on your list of things to like about Medicare Advantage? Well, first, you have to consider the source. The full name for the group that commissioned Milliman is 
the Better Medicare Alliance Center for Innovation in Medicare Advantage. How's that for a name? So Milliman wasn't going to come out with guns blazing against MA the way that Don Berwick and Rick Gilfellan have done in their health affairs commentaries. Let's do the supplemental benefits report first. It's undoubtedly true that MA plans have expanded supplemental benefits significantly, particularly for subsets of their enrollees under the headings of primary health related and special supplemental benefits for chronically ill. <laughs> I've got some good names in there. Those are CMS labels. These additional services generally support more intensive primary care coverage, including adult daycare, in-home palliative care, in-home support services, transportation and medical visits, lower deductibles for diabetes patients, and so on. These are vital services for many enrollees that aren't available to the same extent or at all under traditional Medicare. So that's a good thing. Since 2019, MA plans have had the flexibility to choose which supplemental services to offer their enrollees and the cost sharing terms, if any, under which they offer those benefits. That's important because MA plans must compete for members in the open marketplace. Health insurance shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all proposition. Americans are used to shopping for products and services that meet their needs. Health insurance should be no different. The other Milliman report, as you said, Dave, found that MA generates $32 billion in incremental benefits each year for its enrollees through additional services and lower out-of-pocket costs. I have no reason to doubt these figures. The monthly cost for each fee-for-service enrollee last year was $949. From this amount, Medicare pays $936 for parts A and B, hospitals and physicians, and absorbs a relatively small $14 administrative cost. MA's monthly cost per enrollee is actually $6 lower at $943 per member per month. MA spends much less, $710 per enrollee per month on hospitals and doctors, but offers an additional $123 in benefits with a much higher cost of $110 for profit administration. Most MA plans also include subsidized drugs, whereas traditional Medicare enrollees must purchase additional coverage under Medicare Part D. This cost comparison, Milliman's cost comparison, begs the question of whether fee-for-service Medicare patients are sicker and therefore incur higher medical costs. That's what risk scoring is all about, and we'll get to that in the second part of the show. The comparison also begs the question of whether MA's more hands-on approach to care management and the additional benefits MA plans offer enrollees are worth the higher administrative costs and the plan profits that the government underwrites to fund MA. The best aspects of Medicare Advantage programs are their emphasis on care management. Once the risk scoring is over, MA is a capitated program where the health plan bears the financial risk of caring for its enrollees. This incentivizes plans to invest in more intensive primary care coverage, make earlier interventions with enrollees at risk of acute episodes, promote their members' overall health and wellness. You know, there's a reason for those gym benefits. Got it, Dave. Thanks. Yeah, it sounds like market competition is definitely helping seniors. That That's good. Julie, what's on the pro side of your Medicare Advantage ledger and why? And what MA innovations are you seeing in the market today? Well, the one thing I really appreciate about MA is the STARS program. And we can actually measure quality in MA in ways that aren't happening on the fee-for-service side. And the whole system has taken a lot of grief for an increasing number of plans with four and five stars. But the reality is those plans are getting increasingly better earning those stars. And some would say it's because they're gaming the system. But given my experience with quality, honestly, I'd say that it's hard to game the system in every way without doing some good. So I actually think it's a good thing what's happening quality there. And what it also probably means though, is that it's time to crank down on what quality really means and start to really push those stars in a much harder direction, better metrics and better ways of actually defining that because I know we can do better. So I love that. MA seeing innovation in so many ways. We've talked about here applications of analytics, AI, care management, pop health, provider workflow, patient flow, all those kind of underlying things that are supporting MA. 
But I'm interested in the solutions that are actually going to push us from the high 40s to a much higher percentage of the population moving to MA in a more personalized way. You know, we're starting to see solutions that are helping seniors select plans that are actually better suited to them, as opposed to this kind of, you know, long, blunt process we've had around plan selection, where, of course, we're going to be wasting a lot of money and creating a lot of inefficiency. I'd also say that innovation is going wild in areas of home-based care. Caregivers doing general maintenance, healthy meal delivery, more advanced home monitoring technologies, looking at motion for patient gait issues, uh, activity tracking, et cetera. I mean, all sorts of home-based approaches, especially patient access and transportation, companies like Kaizen, comprehensive care coordination in the home uh, through companies like Ballsky even starting to really think about at-home testing and screening solutions with companies like Let's Get Checked and Everywell and others. And what I like to see are starting to look at some of these solutions that are focused on cognitive health in the home. So we're starting to think, you know, much more holistically about patients, where they are and how to treat them. So exciting. Yeah, that's great. Personalization, tougher quality measures. That's a good list. Dave, anything to add to Julie's comments? I'm going to use my minute here, since I'm not sure where else to do it, to bash fee-for-service medicine generally and Medicare's role in creating America's sick care system. It generates terrible health status metrics. Americans are sicker than ever with declining life expectancy for the last five years. And the system overall is bankrupting the government and costing corporations and individuals more than it ever has. It's just not getting the job done. Why this system with its massive dysfunction should be a standard for comparison to anything baffles me, much less Medicare Advantage. The best company you've never heard of is Cedargate. Their CEO, Dave Snow, should have retired to an Italian villa after he sold Medco to Express Scripts 10 years ago for $29 billion. Instead, the perverse incentives embedded within fee-for-service medicine make Dave so angry that he's created a company with the data and analytics to enable payers, providers, and self-insured employers to undertake value-based contracting. Cedar Gate's client roster is a who's who of healthcare's most promising companies, many of whom sponsor MA plans, Oak Street, Clover, Bright, Village MD, One Medical Alignment, the list goes on. You know, enough is enough. Like Dave Snow, I'm mad as hell and don't want to take it anymore. (laughs) You didn't pull any punches there, Dave. Thanks. That's great. Now let's talk about the bad of Medicare Advantage. MedPAC released a report last week that said more than half of all beneficiaries will be enrolled in an MA plan by 2023. That's next year. But MA plans are coding their enrollees sicker than enrollees in traditional Medicare. And Medicare is paying MA plans 4% more than for similar patients enrolled in traditional Medicare. That's leading to $12 billion in excess payments to MA plans each year. Julie, what are your takeaways from the new MedPAC report? Does that jibe with what you're seeing in the market? Well, I'm particularly struck by this clash of the titans that's becoming the MA wars. I mean, between Don Berwick and Rick Gilfillan and George Halverson, we're seeing a true philosophical war about physician control versus team-based care and the economics of, you know, old school providers versus new school health plans. And honestly, the potential that more data is actually confusing the current day story because we are definitely in the long game and we're probably in a second quarter of this right now. And I think this original deal that CMS struck with these plans, you know, 20 years ago is that they'd provide more benefits than fee-for-service Medicare and would be paid 95% of the cost. So, Fast forward, these numbers that CMS put together that are adjusted based on actuarial risk levels are creating the issues we're in. But as George Halverson would say, finding more codes isn't a business plan, it's a care improvement plan. So what's happening is we do have plans out there who, again, are probably gaming the system in ways because the system's enabling that. But coding real health issues and as many as possible actually helps manage members. So If it's more efficient to use AI and analytics to identify potential issues, to guide humans to do their work more efficiently, then I say hallelujah. And the coding creates, you know, more contextual data than typically exists on the fee-for-service side. So this comparison that MedPAC creates between 
fee for service, similar fee for service recipients is kind of hard for me to swallow as I, I can't imagine we're measuring risk profiles well on the fee for service side either. So we're in this quandary about how we improve our calculation of the risk profiles and the payment levels for those risks. And if MA plans are getting too good at this, then we need to look at what we want them to be doing and look at how we tweak you know, what some of the previous agreements were around payment levels and risk profiles to actually make this work. Because I think directionally, it feels like things are working. It's the perfection we're trying to get to around the spending levels that maybe are not quite in line with what initial expectations were that we need to deal with. Interesting. More granular coding, uh, more data, better care, and just happens to result in more money. So thanks for connecting the dots there. That's great. Dave, what's on your list of cons for the Medicare Advantage program and what policy changes or market reforms do you see coming down the pike to address them? Well, like Julie, I'm not as concerned if MA costs a little more than fee-for-service Medicare if the outcomes are better. You know, people are healthier, there are more benefits, and so on. And maybe it's not such a bad thing if the government pays a little bit more for health care when you look at the gap between what Medicare pays and what commercial insurers pay, which is also distorting the system. But in terms of red flags on Medicare Advantage, number one is risk scoring. The risk scoring in MA is every bit as devious as the payment optimization strategies that occur in fee-for-service medicine, and you just heard me rant about that. The marketplace is always smarter than the government. So let me illustrate this with a non-healthcare story. One of my best friends, Jay Walder, used to be the CEO of the bike share company Motivate in New York City. Like most bike share programs, City Bikes puts its bikes in sturdy docking stations Bike theft from those docking stations is rare, but it's a cost of doing business. Uh, one day, City Bikes engineers came to Jay and said that they had built an impregnable docking station. They were uber confident that no thief could ever steal a bike from it. Jay said, well, I believe you, but let's test it out by putting a couple stations in high crime areas for a weekend and see what happens. So they did. And on Monday morning, all the bikes were gone marketplace is smarter than the government. Turned out those docking stations weren't impregnable after all, and neither is the mechanisms that the government uses to set prices for healthcare. So the more that we can shift pricing formularies into competitive marketplace, the better. And honestly, the risk scoring game in MA is every bit as nefarious as what happens in fee-for-service. The higher the risk score per member, the more money an MA plan gets for that enrollee. And it's amazing how sick these MA members can be. So, you know, MedPAC is on to something there. My U Chicago friend, David Meltzer, thinks we need the equivalent of a Manhattan project to come up with better mechanisms for risk scoring. He's probably right. From a policy perspective, I'd like to see more market-based mechanisms for setting the monthly per member per month rates. If those market-based mechanisms don't work or can't work, we'd have to rely on tighter regulation and more intense oversight. But certainly the current status quo approach isn't sustainable. Other beneficial policy changes for MA could include the following, separating the regional MA payment levels from Medicare fee-for-service. There should be a better way of setting the price than just linking blindly to fee-for-service rates. I'd also like to see this concept of lemon dropping eliminated. Lemon dropping is when an MA plan uses whatever measures it can to push a very sick individual out of their program in, back into traditional Medicare. That's just wrong. If you have an enrollee, you should be responsible for their costs. If the government needs to provide some type of reinsurance mechanism to keep the marketplace stable, so be it. But lemon dropping should not be a part of the equation at all. The other thing I'd like to see is longer contract periods. We still do it year to year. I think if you gave some of these MA plans the opportunity to offer longer contracts, three years, four years, five years, they'd come back with lower prices and they'd also be the beneficiaries of their more active intervention and care management. So all of those changes along with better risk scoring mechanics would make MA better. Yeah, better mousetraps, murder mouse. Thanks, Dave. 
Julie, anything to add to Dave's comments? Well, I guess I'm just quadrupling down at this point, but two things are true. Dave said the market will maximize government regulation at any time. We'll figure out how to be smarter and get the most out of it. And as George Howison points out, there's not unlimited profit here to be made by the plans because of the MLR that was part of the ACA. So, you know, for the second half of this Medicare game, and I think we're going to be in a, a decade boom of Medicare, as we've talked about, or of MA, we need to get the numbers right. We need to alleviate the concerns about data accuracy behind these payment amounts. And I'm not saying the data is right or the payments are right, but we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So, you know, I think there's a lot of different macro approaches people talk about to really solve this. George Harverson talks about kind of a flat tax to create a much bigger pool that allows for the kind of management that Dave was talking about with longer term terms in just a year. And I do think some of that could actually be real and work, but it seems a little bit too aggressive for where we are in our policy machine today. Yeah, that uh, medical loss ratio is really coming in handy lately. That's <laughs> yeah. great. Thanks, Julie. It is a sticky situation. Uh, seniors don't like it when you mess with their benefits, especially if they think they're free. Yet if we bankrupt the Medicare program, no one will have any benefits. So I've got three years until I qualify, so I hope they figure it out soon. Now let's talk about other big stories this past week. Dave, what other big healthcare news was above the fold this week for you? Well, since we were just talking about MLR ratios, United Health Group announced their 2021 earnings this week, and they were stratospheric. Revenues came in higher than projected at close to $300 billion. Profits came in at something in the neighborhood of 18 to $19 billion. They are, of course, the big dog in Medicare Advantage, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good to talk about them in today's show. But overall, United's revenue has tripled from 2010 to 2021, and profit has almost quadrupled. And the company continues to make more of its money from owning doctor groups and controlling pharmacy benefits above and beyond its health insurance provisions. So MLR only takes you so far. United Health Group has figured out how to get into the provider game and make even more money. Interesting. Thanks, Dave. Julie, how about you? What other big healthcare news appeared on your radar? Okay, I'm going to go with actually not news, but just putting on everyone's radar what's going on in the conference scene since it's a bit of my old world. Have you guys seen the Vive conference that HLTH is doing, kind of a, a refresh of Chime? Yeah, I've heard of it, Yeah, uh, but that's about it. Yeah, this thing is going to take Kim's down. I don't know if they're really going to be able to pull off a 3,500-person meeting in Miami at the beginning of March, although it's Florida, so who cares, right? <laughs> but <laughs> check it out. Some interesting branding, um, really focused all on health information technology. I think Hims might have really met its match. Interesting. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. Thank you. For me, it was ECRI's list of the top 10 health technology hazards for 2022. It was interesting to see telemedicine workflows make the list. It's all about the ability to integrate virtual care with your existing systems. And if you can't, it could get pretty scary. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Julie. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics we discussed on today's show, please visit our website at foresighthealth.com. You also can find a recording of this podcast and all our podcasts on the Healthcare Now Radio Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other streaming services. Subscribe now and don't miss another segment of the best 20 minutes in healthcare. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Berta with Foresight Health.